Non mais on te voit, mais t'es légèrement de trois quarts. Ah voilà, la tête de face là. Moi je check, est-ce que vous voyez mon écran On voit bien ton écran. Ouais, on voit pas super bien. Bon, très bien. Alors après, pour le retirer. Laurent, tu es là Ah ouais, tu as dû le faire avant, c'est sûr. Tu as bien le bon code et tout il suffit que tu appuies. Normalement, il suffit que tu appuies sur. Euh, appuies sur que... Il suffit que tu appuies sur le. Attends, je vais essayer le de t'envoyer la, la conférence, mais normalement, il suffit d'appuyer appuyer sur ce lien et ça marche. Hein. Attends, je retrouve le code. Ah bah alors, si tu veux. Uh, can we start? We have one more minute. Uh, yes, uh, we are waiting for Laurent because it seems that uh, there is a technical problem with his computer. Okay, okay. Can we wait or can we start? We are ready. No, no. We need to wait, Laurent, because Laurent is the first guy to, 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 to speak. Okay, no problem. We'll wait. Uh, meanwhile, okay. hello, Vijay. Hello. Nice to see you. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Vijay. Hello. Hello, Arya. I'm Joe. Hello, everyone. Uh, Vijay, uh, Vijay, Dr. Ashok Shem want to uh, communicate something. Can you just coordinate with Ashok Shem? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He wants to... Uh... One second, one second. I just wanted to say we are ready to stream. Hello, Laurent. Uh, Dr. Patrick, yes, I'll brief the program. Um, we'll start the meeting at uh, probably a few minutes' time. Uh, we have our uh, the Orthopedic Association of South Indian States, uh, the president elect Dr. Professor Dr. Selvaraj here. He will just say a few interactive words and then directly we'll go to the first topic anatomy. Yes, Laura, yes, I... uh, normally, 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 uh, tu prêt, Laurent? Attends, attends. Je rentre les trucs. Ouais, mais il fallait faire ça avant. Hein. Ah oui, je sais. Uh, followed by the, uh, the uh, clinical diagnosis, <coughs> arthroscopy, and current concept. We will go in the sequence. The first talk will be the anatomy of the distal <coughs> radial joint and the triangular fibrocartilage injuries, followed by the clinical diagnosis. And then imaging, and then arthroscopy of the DRUJ and TFCC injury, and finally the current concepts of the 
DRUJ and TFCC. Uh, the moderators today session are Dr. Ajo from Kolkata. Uh, we also have Dr. Vijay and we also have Dr. Ashok Shyam as a uh, panelist. Uh, we'll be joining a few more panelists in the due course time. Uh, we will have question and answers at the end of the session. The panelists can uh, uh, they can mediate and they can ask questions in terms uh, for the delegates and they can respond to it. Even they can also have conversation if they have any questions. Uh, Dr. Patrick, we are ready. Uh, whenever you say, we can start. Yes, uh, just one minute. Laurent, on t'attend. Uh... Oui. C'est ça donne quoi là Je suis dessus là. Je suis dessus là. Et t'es dessus sur quoi Ça veut dire quoi Je suis dessus. Il y a marqué lancer la réunion. Je suis. J'ai appuyé Tu nous vois ou tu ne nous vois pas Non, je... Attends, do, 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 you, do you see uh, um, Laurent or not on, on... Because I don't see Laurent on the panel. Yeah, uh, I'm just waiting to... Uh, I could not see him also. I'm just waiting for him. Aaron, how? Aaron. Yeah, tell me, Vijay. Uh, how, long, how long will you need? Can we start? Mais tu n'as pas checké avant tout ça? Mais si, bien sûr que j'ai checké avant. Aaron, duration. De refaire quoi? Uh, doc, the uh, first talk will be Dr. Uh, Laurel, he'll speak about the anatomy. <coughs> yes, I know, I know, but uh, um, yes, you can speak about uh, anatomy, uh, Vijay, or. Because I don't know where is Laurent. Or you can start with Patrick, who can uh, go ahead with the clinical diagnosis. Okay. And uh, by then, if he comes, we can ask him with the second talk. Okay. 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 Can we start? Yeah. Uh, I'll uh, uh, I'll have a uh, Professor Dr. Seloras to have a few words, and then probably we can start with the meeting. Oh, good evening, okay. and welcome you all to this uh, second seminar of the Journal of Hand and Microsurgery. Uh, in uh, 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 association with the Orthopedic Indian Orthopedic Association, Orthopedic Association of South Indian States of um, uh, and the Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association and Thirichi Ortho Club. On behalf of all of you, we welcome you to this uh, interesting topic, distal radial joint and triangular fibrillopathic injuries. Uh, to begin with, uh, we uh, here having uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Seluraj, who uh, is uh, you know has accepted our invitation to be the panelist and also uh, to give a few interactive words about this seminar. And then probably we'll go to Dr. Patrick to start the seminar. Dr. Silvaj, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I must thank uh, my dear friend, Dr. Terence, the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Anatomy and Microsurgery for giving me this opportunity to inaugurate and talk a few words on this session, session. injuries of the disability of joint and TFC injuries. There are very often there are neglected injuries and the patient have a lot of disability which goes under And for an average orthopedic surgeon, this is totally Greek and Latin. They don't understand the implications. Just see the x-ray. They do not understand that unless you manage these injuries properly, the hand and the wrist are never going to have a satisfactory function. I'm sure this will throw a lot of light into uh, the neglected part of the wrist injuries. Uh, with these few words, and uh, Terence has organized a very good international faculty to uh, talk on the various topics of this uh, uh, difficult, rather less understood area. Uh, with these few words, I have a great pleasure in inaugurating the webinar, and I wish this journal club a grand success. Thank you very much. Over to you, Terence. Thank, thank you very much sir, for your kind words and appreciation. Uh, sir, we'll be leaving uh, uh, to another important meeting, so we'll be uh, uh, having sir with us for a few minutes. Uh, with this brief introduction, uh, we'll go to Dr. Patrick, who can uh, start uh, with the first topic of clinical diagnosis. Patrick, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Terence. Um, 
Can you see my screen now? now? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. OK. So during the last two decades, um, an increased knowledge of uh, functional anatomy and pathophysiology of the TFCC, and also technical refinements in arthroscopic and surgical repair of the TFCC have uh, contributed to um, a great change of the surgeon's perspective toward the Drew's pathology. So clinically, a complete evaluation needs an, an extremely thorough history and of course, physical examination. Uh, physical examinations should always include the unaffected site for comparison. In the acute uh, fracture setting, the mechanism of uh, the injury, oh, sorry. I need to move that one. Yeah. The mechanism of uh, injury should be uh, elicited because uh, high energy injuries are often associated with more severe fractures or worse outcomes. So physical examination in acute injury is limited by pain. Swelling, echemosis, and wrist deformity are always observed. During surgery, after radial fixation of the distal radius fracture, the distal radial, radial inner joint must be tested by stability. For arm rotation and druge, ballotment should be similar to the normal side. Crepitus, grinding, or clunking may indicate a malreduction or implant malposition and involves in a careful reevaluation of reduction and fixation of the bone. An instable druge may benefit from slightly increased radial distraction during the fixation because overcorrection of the radial eight indirectly shortens the ulnar and tightens the interosseous membrane and the radio ulnar ligaments. Diagnosis of chronic druge instability is challenging because signs and symptoms are often unclear. Patients may report frank episodes of druge dislocation, but more commonly pain and loss of function are presenting complaints. Patients may report difficulty lifting objects or clinking with forearm rotation. Examination should identify sites of tenderness and gross deformity. A subluxing ulnar end may be preeminent dorsally or the caput ulnar syndrome may be present. The patient is asked to position the wrist to reproduce the pain. The examiner should listen for a clunk. Wrist range of motion must be compared with the injured site. UCU subluxation and foveal tenderness should be checked. Grip and pinch, and pinch strength should be tested bilaterally. Three different signs. The first one is the piano case sign described as a dorsal resting position of the ulna that translates volar with applied stress. There is a very nice sensibility, sensi sensitivity, but a, sh a short specificity for this sign. Volar subluxation produces slight fullness on the volar aspect of the, on the wrist with the depression dorsally. Subluxation is more subtle and difficult to detect than front dislocation, and that is imperative to compare findings with the control lateral, suppose normal site, especially because normal laxity differs considerably among individuals. Point tenderness is common over the fovea, which is located between the styloid process and the FCU tendon. The second one is the Drew stress test or ballotment test. It was originally described with the forearm in neutral position, shocking the ulnar relative to the radius is painful and or grossly unstable in symptomatic patients. To perform this test, the examiner holds the distal radius fixed while applying alternating dorsal and volar forces to the mobile distal ulnar. High specificity, but only moderate sensitivity. Because more laxity is naturally present with the forearm in neutral rotation, accuracy can be improved by also testing in pronation or in supination. This test can be performed with injection of a local anesthetic to eliminate the pain. The third one, and the more nice, is performed by having the patient push up with the affected wrist from a seated position using the arm rest, which causes exacerbation of unarsided wrist pain. The test was reported to have a sensitivity of 100% for the diagnosis of TFCC injuries. A modification described by Adams 
as the patient remains seated and applied toward force to the examination table located in front of the patient. Comparatively, increased depression of the ulnar head on the affected side shows instability. This is the test, as you can see. So now I'll give my um, speak to um, Frederick for imaging and the different possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patrick. Uh, we will uh, have the uh, second talk. Meanwhile, we have uh, uh, the panel. I, uh, I think Laurent is uh, with us. Maybe Laurent can speak about anatomy. Perfect. So, Laurent, tu, Laurent, tu nous entends? No, Frédéric, so. Can you see my, uh, my slides? Yeah. Okay. Hello. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer, Dr. Terence, for inviting me to talk about TFCC imagery and, of course, Dr. Patrick Couvet. Um, the TFCC is made up of uh, several elements, which are the articular disc that you can see here in yellow, the radial ulnar ligaments, also in yellow, the dorsal and palmar radial ulnar ligaments, with their insertion on the fovea here and on the styloid process here. The ulnocarpal ligament also, ulnolinar, and ulnotricotral. And finally, the meniscus. As you can see uh, on this uh, MRI and on uh, this atro uh, CT atrography, you can distinguish uh, the articular disc just here and here on the CT atrography. You can also distinguish the, the foveal insertion of the TFCC and its styloid insertion, and finally, the meniscus here. Um, on sagittal view, you can see the dorsal and the palmar radio ulnar ligament. Here you have the dorsal ligament, and here the palmar ligaments, and here the articularis. So the, the dorsal and palmar ligament are surrounding the articularis. Here on uh, MRI, and here on CT atrography, you can see the palmar and the <laughs> dorsal radio ulnar ligaments. You can also distinguish the ulnocarpal ligaments. You have here on this sagittal view uh, of uh, uh, CT atrography, the articular disc, and here you have the ulnocarpal ligament, ulnolinar, and ulnotriquetral. You can see here the pisiform, and here the triquetrum. TFCC has uh, two major functions. Um, First, uh, uh, it stabilizes the radio ulnar joint via the radio ulnar ligament and their foveal insertion, just here, in association with the ulnocarpal ligament, which also participate in joint stability. This is what we call the proximal component of the TFCC. Second, it participates in shock absorption to the ulnar side of the wrist via the articular disc. The styloid insertion of the TFCC and the meniscus. This is what we call the distal component of the TFCC just here. Depending on the structure involved in and its function, the management will be different. So damage to structures involved in stabilizing the wrist should be repaired as much as possible by surgery, 
while the structures involved in shock absorption will instead be subject to debridement. So there are two pathological contexts. First, a traumatic context where the movement involved is often an extension and pronation of the wrist, as you can see in certain sports like uh, tennis, golf, or fencing. And second, a degenerative context where the determin determining element is the presence of a positive ulnar variance, which will increase the stresses on the ulnar side of the wrist. We use the Palmer classification with two classes, class one lesion corresponding to traumatic uh, lesion, for which the fourth stage classification has been refined by ATSE, depending on the anatomical site of the lesion, and class two lesion, with, which correspond to degenerative lesion, also called ulnar impaction syndrome, with five stages of increasing severity. So let's start with the class one lesion, the traumatic injury. It may be a class one E lesion, which only involve the articular disc, which uh, means a structure involved in the absorption of shocks and stresses and without stabilizer function. You can see on this uh, uh, CT arthrography, a perforation of the articular disc here, just here, and on the contrary, respect of dorsal and palmar radio ulnar ligaments. Class 1B lesion may involve the foveal insertion of the radio ulnar ligaments or the styloid insertion of the TFCC which are two structures different, belonging for the first one to the proximal components and for the second to the distal component of the TFCC. So they have two different functions and the treatment will be completely different. The lesion, of course, can also affect both components simultaneously. Here is, uh, you can see on these images, uh, a few lesions you have a lesion of the styloid insertion of the TFCC here on this MRI. Here you have a lesion of the foveal insertion of the CT atrography. And here on uh, MRI, you have a lesion of uh, the foveal insertion of the TFCC. And here you have a complete lesion of the TFCC a tear at the foveal insertion and at the styloid insertion. And you can notice also a perforation of the, the articular disc just here. Class 1C lesion are difficult to diagnose. They concern the ulnocarpal ligaments, ulnolunar and ulnotricotrol which this ligament participates in stability of the distal radial nerve joints. You can see here an example on this MRI. It's an atro MRI with the tear at the insertion uh, of the ulnolunate ligament just here on this frontal view and here on this sagittal view. Diagnos diagnose this lesion are very difficult. Class 1D lesion involves the radial insertion of the TFCC, as you can see here on this frontal view and on this axial view. On this uh, class 1D lesion, the distinction must, must be made between isolated lesion of the articular disc, which don't have a stabilizing function, and lesion which extend to the palmar or the dorsal radio ulnar ligament or both of them and which compromise joint stability. And again, there are two different function structure and two different treatments. You can see a few lesion here. You have a 1D uh, lesion here with uh, radial T at the 
uh, 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 the radial insertion of the, the articular disc here on this central image. Uh, and uh, on the contrary, the uh, dorsal radio ulnar ligament and the palmar radio ulnar ligament are completely respected. Here also a 1D, uh, class 1D lesion. You can see on this image is a perforation of the articular disc here, just here. And you can see that the lesion extends to the dorsal radio ulnar ligament on this frontal view. And just here, you can see that the lesion extends to uh, the, radio, uh, the dorsal radio ulnar ligament. So uh, here is a, a summary of class one traumatic injury where the classification is based on the anatomical location of the injury. In class 1B and 1D lesion, it is very necessary to know whether the lesion can compromise the stability of the wrists. In class 1B lesion, it is very important to know whether the lesion uh, concerns the foveal insertion of the TFCC. And in class 1D lesion, it is very important to know if the lesion is limited to the articular disc or if it extends to the distal radial nerve ligament, ear dorsal ligament, and ear palmar ligaments. We can continue with uh, class two degenerative lesion, also called ulnar impaction syndrome. They are favored by positive ulnar variance and progress in five stages of increasing severity. So, first class two A lesion. It's just a thinning of the articular disc. In class 2B lesion, there is appearance of ulnar or lunar chondropathy. Class 2C lesion, there is a disc perforation. Class 2D lesion, you have a perforation or tear on the lunar tricotral ligament, as you can see here. And class 2E, there is a radiocarpal or radio ulnar distal osteoarthritis. Uh, there, you can see a few lesions. Uh, on the left side, you have a class 2C lesion with the perforation of the articular disc. And you can see also uh, chondropathy on the, on the ulnar head, just here. Here you have a class 2D lesion with the perforation of the articular disc, a tear of the lenotricotral ligaments, chondropathy here on the ulnar head, and chondropathy on the lunate. Another one here, class 2D lesion with perforation of the articular disc, little tear on the lenotricotral ligaments, chondropathy of the ulnar head with bone edema here. And you can also notice that there is a ulnar positive variance. The radiological assessments always include radiographic images with a frontal view in pronation and may include, depending on the case, a CT atrography or MR atrography or just MRI. We will look first for positive ulnar variance. If the lesion concerns radial insertion, it is necessary to specify whether it also concerns the ligaments or if it only affects the disc, it's important. And if it's on the ulnar side, does it concern the proximal or the distal component or both, or both of them? Of course, it will be necessary to evaluate the articular the articular cartilages. You may know that uh, there are some pitfalls. In particular, uh, the ulnar pre-styloid recess. It's a little recess between uh, the, um, the, the styloid insertion of the TFCC 
and uh, the meniscus, a little recess here. And you can see on MRI this recess as a hyper signal. The second pitfall is uh, a hyper signal that you can see sometime uh, between the two bundle of the TFCC, uh, two bundle uh, on the foveal insertion of the TFCC, the foveal insertion and the styroid insertion, uh, this hyper-signal hyper corresponding to a ligament, uh, which is called the ligamentum subcreantum. We can also observe a hyper-signal at the radial insertion of the articular disc, class, like here, related to presence of island cartilage, which should not be confused with perforation, as you can see here on this CT arthrography. It's a perforation and it's only cartilage. Finally, it should be remembered that the TFCC anomaly is not always symptomatic and that it's necessary to always opacify the three major compartments of the wrists in CT arthrography or uh, MR arthrography because there are lesions isolated from only one of the two proximal or distal components of the ulnar insertion of the TFCC. And you can see them if you only inject one compartment, only one compartment. Thank you for your attention. And uh, now, uh, uh, Dr. Didier Fontes will uh, talk to you about arthroscopy, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seton, and the previous uh, uh, topic. Uh, can we go ahead to the anatomy if uh, uh, Dr. Laurent is there? I mean, can we start? Oh, I, don't, I, don't know where, I don't know where it's Laurent. I think he do have a problem with his uh, uh, Wi-Fi um, network. And um, that's, what, that's what he exactly told, because he's not in Paris, but uh, outside Paris. And uh, he tried to find another place to uh, get a better um, network. Is that you say if si, si Laurent is in the clinic, by hasard? No, he's not in the clinic. He's in okay. KOR. Okay. Okay. okay, we'll go with the other topic. The, uh, uh, by Dr. Didier Fontes. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for this kind invitation of, so for this uh, worldwide webinar. So we'll speak about the interest of arthroscopy in, in the DIUJ pathology. First of all, as described by, by Frédéric Zetoun, there is two main uh, roles for this TFCC. First, it is a chalk absorber. And as soon as you can experience a fall down on the outstretching hand, you can have a central lesion, essentially central lesion of the TFC. But sometimes in the over twist trauma, you can experience some peripheral lesion because the TFC is a main stabilizer of the IOJ. So it's a two main way to observe traumatic lesion of this ligament. As described by Frederick Andrew Palmer, as described in 1989, the first description for these traumatic lesions, but the 1B and 1D lesion, as described too by Zetun, have been updated. Concerning the 1B lesion, it is essentially the foveal lesions which are very interesting. And Andrea Atze with the EWAS Society has defined two classes, the so class two, when there is a complete tear of the, of the foveal attachment of the TFC and a class three, where there is only the proximal lesion of the TFC. Regarding 1D lesion, as it is previously said, it's very important to assess the location, the precise location of the lesion. Generally, it's a central lesion. It is on the non-vascular disc of the TFC, but sometimes it can go volar, dorsal, or complete, complete lesion, but sometimes with a little piece of bone during fractures. So it's very important to have good assessment of this type of, this type of lesion to define the, the accurate and the classification of the lesion. As you know, it's also important to assess ulnar variance because normally for, for a neutral variance, 
there is unar load inferior to 20% of the total of the loads. But as soon as the univariate increase, you can observe up to 40% of unar load. So it's very important to assess this univariance with very good X-ray to, to know where there is or no an overload on the unar side of the wrist. You know, arthroscopy is probably the best way to assess the TFCC. It can give a good exploration for the texture of the, of the ligament. We can assess the classical trampoline sign. Sometimes we will find some old inside. So it's very important. It is really the best way because it's a dynamic way to assess the TFC. Concerning the four-wheel lesions, Andrea C has described the hook sign when you pull upward and readily with a probe, the TFC, and you can observe this wave effect as soon, it is typically the consequence of a total avulsion of the forward attachment of the TFCC. But sometimes the lesion is only proximal and we have described the ghost sign. So the probe is introduced into, into the DIUJ and we can have this, uh, this, uh, this space is uh, like, like a ghost waving under a sheet and does a TFC, and especially on the ulnar aspect of the att attachment. It's very typical of this proximal uh, unique lesion of the TFCC. But sometimes the exploration was not sufficient and it should be necessary to have a DIUJ exploration. It's not the most simple uh, technique to do. Because, but in, in, in case of the IUJ instability, you have a larger space and you can so easily observe here the TFCC foveal attachment of your ligament. So, after this exploration, you will have the diagnosis of your type of lesion and you have a, clinic, you have a, a specific a semiology, arthroscopic semiology, when the different signs concerning the different lesions of your ligament. So what is the strategic therapeutic? Uh, uh, Patrick will speak about it, but it's, of course it is, depends, depends on the location and on the vascularization or not of the lesion. And also it's important to know whether there is or not a DIUJ instability or if the lesion is at risk of instability. And sometimes also it can be associated with radius fracture. So all this, all this tree, also these, these patterns are very important to the decision. First of all, the therapeutic attitude will be based on histopathology. For radial lesion, palmer 1D, or central lesion, palmer 1A, they are situated in non-vascular reserve and shock absorbing area. So we can propose only a debridement. You have to know that we can debrid up to two thirds of the central disc with no instability of the IUJ. So the debridement can be a good idea. Considering peripheral lesions situated in vascular reserve and stabilizing area, so we will have to do an attempt of suture. It can be open or arthroscopy. But why to debride the TFCC? You know there is no vascularization and there is no innervation too. So why is it painful? In fact, it is painful because of the synovitis which is around it. And first of all, the medical treatment can be proposed with a, a corticoid injection, for example. But if its a treatment is not good, of course, it will create a meniscus-like syndrome that we can observe in the knee with, when there is a lesion of the meniscus. In fact, it is like a little pebble in your shoe. So when you have a pebble in your shoe, you want to remove it. And also, so it's only for histologic reasons, depending on TFCC vascularization. If you have no vascularization, you have no opportunity to observe spontaneous healing of your ligament. And also for biomechanical reasons, because as you see, when you debride the TFCC, you decrease the urinal load on the urinal side. So how to debride? We will use the classical installation for arthroscopy. For us, we do prefer the Tour de Whipple, Whipple Tower for this procedure. The scope is introduced in the 3 4 portal, very classical, and instruments in the 4 5 or 6 R portals. 
So it's very classical for the exploration of radiocarbon space. Our preference is for the radio frequency devices. It's very, very easy. You see here, it's a one A lesion. We begin to debride on the radial side and you see it's a it's very, very short procedure and very, very precise, very accurate. The only problem is the bubbles that you have to, to a spear, a spear with, a, with a needle. And you can debride all the central portion of your TFCC with this type of technique. It's a real time, you do that in two or three minutes maximum. So it's very easy and you can do a very complete debridement of all this non-vascularized lesion. But as soon as the lesion is more dorsal on the 1D2, so it's not the same problem. You will have to attend to reattachment. So it's not a normal to do a surgical open procedure. And I think that uh, uh, Patrick Rouvet will speak about that. But if you prefer, you will have to do an arthroscopic procedure. And we have described the one that I will more describe more precisely for the foveal tail reattachment. And we will use this type of, uh, of devices, a mini push lock devices to reattach it on the radial rim. It's the same thing when the weather is volar or complete, 1D1, 1D4, so you will have to reattach it and you can do that completely arthroscopically too. Sometimes when it is associated with fracture, it can be easy to put a little KY like that. So you have to assess this, this radio, this ulnar sign as soon as you have a fracture, as you know, because the patient generally experience pain, post-operative pain on the ulnar side of the wrist, not on the radial side after a radial fracture. So it's very important to accept the TFCC during every fracture of these two radius. Concerning so foveal lesions, it's very important first to have a good diagnosis and Frederic has, has shown you how to have a good exploration with a MRI and an CT scan. So it's very important to have a good technique to reattach it. The first guys who are interesting in that, we are our friends, Italian friends, Andrea Atze and Riccardo Lucchetti, who have proposed a mixed arthroscopic and mini open procedure. So it's very interesting procedures. You have described the reattachment using little anchors, but you have to do a little open. And, and the, the other problem is you have a knot inside, inside the articulation which can be painful and source of so mechanical disorders after it. Uh, Toshi Nakamura has described the transulnar uh, reattachment. So it's very interesting procedure with the use of a little jig, but it's not very easy to put one or two pins to recover them, to, to put your, your suture. It's very long, very tedious, and uh, we reserve it only in class three partial lesions when there is no intraarticular lesion, but it's only in the DIUJ. And also a very interesting procedure had been proposed by Bill Gessler, but it was, he proposed uh, these devices, which is unfortunately very expensive. And uh, especially the technique was very complicated with more than 14 steps to do, to do that. Even with a good skill of arthroscopy that I think to have, it's very difficult for me to do that. You have three portals, you have to recover your, your suture, it's very complicated. So it, it was really too complicated and too expensive for me. So it's for that I have described more simple techniques using this type of device, this type of mini push locks from Artrex company and with a needle and a fiber wire. So it's very simple and not so expensive. First of all, is to introduce your sutures, your fiber wire inside your needle. It seems, uh, Easy, but it's not so easy. So it's important to do that. You put your good suture inside it, and then you will use your, your push lock. First, you will have to debride the foveal lesion because it's very rare to have an acute lesion to treat immediately. So it's more chronic. So there is bad tissue, synovial tissue. You have to remove it to expose all, the, all your fovea, and you will see here complete avulsion of your TFCC with the use of little shaver, full radius shavers. After, you will assess the fovea and you can to debride it with a little burr, like we can see here. 
So you, you have good view of your foveal only from the free four portal, and you can completely assess the basis of the styloid at the, at the, the attachment, for the attachment of the foveal aspect. Then you will have to do a little hole to prepare the introduction of the introduction of your, of your anchor. I do prefer this little hole. It gives more, less debris than the, like the, this uh, type of drill. And you do, your assistant will do, you have to only to be very precise for the orientation of, of your hole. And then you can assess it with a little probe to be sure there is no, uh, no fracture. It is completely very good. And you can control it with an X-ray control. And then it's very, it seems very simple. You don't have the, the 14 steps that describes Abel Gessler. You introduce your needle one centimeter more proximal to the, to the free four portal. And you introduce it inside your TFCC, pulling like that your suture. You do this little, little turning to, to recover your, your, your stitches and you don't remove your needle. You have just have to but to pull it very few millimeters, you will reintroduce it from two millimeters uh, more dorsal. So you recover your suture through the three, four portal like that. And then you go on the same thing, more dorsally to pull back your, your suture inside, inside the articulation that like you can see here. And you just have to, to pull out with a little punch, this suture, and you will have realized very easily a U-shaped suture on the ulnar foveal aspect of the TFCC. So you see, it's very simple. It's percutaneously for the introduction of the needle, and you don't have to do the utilization of different material, very expensive material. So as soon as you have done that, it's quite finished. You introduce the two stitches inside the eyelet of the mini push lock. And then you will have to refine your little hole that you have previously prepared on the basis of the styloid. You will see it. You introduce your, your device here. And you will find your, where you find back the hole. Oh, sorry. And then your assistants just have to, to put some, uh, some hemming off of the, of, the laser, of, the, of the device to introduce it completely inside the, um, the foveal hole that you have done. You can see here on the left. It's very, very easy. And after, you just have to cut the suture and you see you have no knot inside, no bad tissue that can, can create some, uh, some bad reaction, some adverse reaction. And then you can assess with a probe that you have refined a good trampoline sign and there is no more hook signs or girl sign. Sometimes it's necessary to, to go on to the suture and the dorsal aspect of the lesion. And it's a classical 1B lesion. And for that, we use the outside in technique described by Terry Whipple on the dorsal, on the, the deeper shift of ECU. Concerning the post-op uh, period, if you have done a, a debridement, you have no, no, no indication to any immobilization. But if you have done a reattachment of your TFCC, we use a long cast like that during three weeks, and then we go on with the three more weeks with a shorter one, and we begin the rehabilitation and return to sport generally, not at three weeks, but sometimes we have no choice and generally after two or three months after the procedure. So it was for the traumatic lesions concerning the ulnar plus syndrome. We just have only some, some uh, slides about the, the wafer procedure. As you know, to, to decrease the pressure of the ulnar aspect and to, to, to recover the normal ulnar load, different options are proposed. The classical shaft osteotomy, it is a MILS procedure. You can do the uh, Conte Sandvald osteotomy or the wafer procedure. The wafer procedure had been proposed by Feldham in 1992 with an open procedure, but sometimes it can create some, uh, uh, some impeachment on the proximal if there is too large uh, resection, and it's frequent to observe 
BIOJ uh, arthritis. So uh, this technique was not very, very popular because of that. So it's for that with different uh, uh, surgeons, we have described the arthroscopic way to do this wafer procedure. And we, we use for that classical installation, we have control with a mini fluoro scan, classical portals, three, four for the scope, four, five or six are for the instruments and six you for the, the outflow. First time is diagnosis. As, a, as you have seen on the X-ray, there is an extent of different type of lesions, condomalacia, lesion of lunar tracheal ligament, TFCC lesions. So it's the best way to assess all that, to do that without your arthroscopy. And then you will have to do the debridement. And as we do for traumatic lesion, with the bride, we realize the synovectomy with the, the mini shaver and, the, and this type of uh, radiofrequency devices. And then you will have to do a mini acromioplasty of the, the bombing uh, aspect of uh, the ulnar head. And it's very important to ask your assistant to, to, to turn in full supination and full pronation, not to let any beak on the, on the, on the distal extremity of the ulnar after your procedure. So you can reduce so that the bombing aspect of the ulnar head. You can control that with a scope after, with an arthroscopy, with a, with a fluoro scan. And then it's very simple to have a good rehabilitation of two or three weeks after the sur surgery and return to sports, which is already to three or three months, like the previous procedures. So concerning the results of this uh, wafer arthroscopic procedure, it uh, experiences lower complication rate and quicker recoveries and ulnar surgical osteotomy. And we observe generally an improvement of grip strength, arc of motion, and clinical scores. But you will have some to wait more than five or six months to have the definitive results. So it's sometimes rather long and you have to explain that to your patient. In conclusion, arthroscopy for us is the best way to assess TFCC lesion. Our old technique, all inside, not less arthroscopic procedures, seems to be reproducible for peripheral lesion, accurate and reliable results with a short learning curve. Concerning the breedment and wafer, they are very simple techniques and rewarding procedures. For us, arthroscopy is indirectly for the gold standard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Didier, for your wonderful talk. Uh, it's really amazing to have the entire team from, uh, you know, uh, to speak on this interesting DRUJ and TFCC talk. Uh, in the meanwhile, the next speaker is Dr. Patrick Hove. Uh, let him uh, have his presentations uh, uh, ready. Uh, we actually uh, avoided the introduction of all the speakers just in sake uh, to save the time. Uh, we have sent uh, the Zoom link with all our speakers, uh, a short brief uh, CV that they can know by itself. And these uh, French surgeons are very simple and uh, you know, humble. They just want to tell their name and their uh, you know, they, uh, work and their schedule. So they're so humble and they're helpful to us you know, in having this webinar. Uh, we uh, have a few panelists also here and a few questions are also in the uh, Q&A sections, uh, which we can take after the final uh, talk from Dr. Patrick. Uh, Dr. Patrick, you can go ahead with your talk. Uh, you have to unmute your, Dr. Patrick, please unmute yourself. Is it better now? Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. Okay, just one moment. Is it good for you? Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, um, Didier, for this nice talk uh, with your perfect... Uh, uh, mastery describing uh, all the different uh, specific techniques using uh, arthroscopy uh, possibilities. Uh, even if you talk about um, the different um, classics, um, possibilities, I'd like to, um, to describe you the, um, the, 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 the current treatment um, protocol for um, all these uh, different um, injuries of the distal uh, radial joint. 
Um, so kinetic uh, dysfunction of the um, distal uh, radioulnar joint are, as you know, uh, multifactorial and may be caused by a variety of pathologies. Uh, the spectrum of uh, clinical condition that may cause uh, this uh, dysfunction is so wide that uh, no classification can be comprehensive enough to include all of them. Uh, Nakamura distinguished between uh, acute, that means uh, less than six months, or chronic instabilities more than six months, but many authors do not consider this definition as relevant for a treatment strategy. Instabilities of the joint may be caused by osseous or primarily soft tissue lesions. Distal radius uh, fractures with or without avulsion of the ulnar styloid process or forced forearm rotation are responsible for, uh, for the majority of the instabilities. Uh, and uh, regarding... Sorry, yes? Please, please share your screen. Uh, please share. They, they could not see your screen. Oh. Share your screen. Oh, yeah. So you, you don't see my, my first... Uh, Okay, you can start with the first slide. I can go ahead. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Okay, I'll go back. Did you see the first uh, diapo or not? <clears throat> uh, we, we are seeing a slide. Did you see, now you see all the slides? No, no, we cannot see it. Why is that? C'est très flou et t'as pas fait l'écran no. total, voilà. Yeah, it's, it's, it's getting better now. The flu, let's see. Yeah, is it okay now? Uh, it's, it's better now, uh, it's still unclear. Why? <laughs> Uh, I know be, 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 at the beginning I, try, I put something with the video. Is it the, 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 the reason? Uh, you can start. I don't, I don't know. You can, I don't know how to change the, the. You can close. I can, you can start from the first if you want. Is it better now? Yeah, it is better. better. It is better. Is it better now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. So as I told, instabilities of the joint may be caused by osseous or, pre or soft uh, tissue lesions, uh, distal radius fractures with or without uh, avulsion of the styloid um, are um, responsible for the majority of the joint instabilities. And regarding soft tissues, basic pathology of most dysfunction of the joint is complete detachment of the TFCC, as told you, uh, my friend Didier. So distal radius fracture plus or minus osseous avulsion of the TFCC is the first um, part. Uh, this is different pictures with and without reparation. Uh, avulsion of the ulnar styloid process are suspicious of joint instability and should be dealt during the procedure. Examination of the joint stability is mandatory uh, during the surgery after fixation of the distal radius fractures. After reduction and internal fixation of the, of the fracture, the balancement test that I described um, is performed dynamically in different rotational position of the forearm. Refixation of the ulnar styloid is mandatory in case of instability. Afterwards, immobilization in neutral form rotation is recommended for a long, for two or three weeks with the long arm cast. Soft tissue injuries and detachment of the TFCC. I'd like to evoke the uh, four leaf clover algorithm um, described by Mark uh, Garcia Elias. That is a tool that acts as a checkpoint to ensure that all the different components are addressed to improve clinical outcomes. It's very important to realize that, that four pathologies, four different pathologies, TFCC injury, bone deformity, cartilage damage, and UCU instability are not mutually exclusive. One patient may have one or more of these associated local pathologies. So there are a myriad of different clinical conditions. Every one of these multiple situations deserves a specific treatment. And 
This is a Venn diagram and it represents the different combinations of pathologies that may be present in the joint dysfunctions. Most treatment combinations are possible in that joint and you can see all the different possibilities. A lot of have been described by Didier, but the traditional one, um, you know, of course, all of these different possibilities. How to use this four leaf clover algorithm? Physician must examine the patient and from the accompanying radiograph or CT scanner, answer yes or no to the following four questions. Is there any bone deformity and or radio lens discrepancy that could have influenced the development of the dysfunction? Second one, is there any cartilage defect? Is there a TFCC injury? And finally, is there an easily luxable uh, UCU tendon? Once the answers have known, the surgeon needs to use the Venn diagram and place a check mark, yes or no, uh, for the four questions. It determines what is the overlapping zone that best describes that specific patient. And they finally apply the combinations of different treatments that best fulfills the needs of the patient sharing the overlapping zone. Circle A, the circle contains the, 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 the joint dysfunction cases with a bony deformity in the form of a distal radius malunion or a radio ulnar lens discrepancy, as you can see here. If the shape and orientation of one of the articulating surface do not match the other corresponding surface, a joint ingruity and a painful synovitis will emerge. To solve this problem, the bone deformity needs to be corrected by even an ulnar shortening osteotomy as a Milch osteotomy or a wedge osteotomy of the distal radius or both procedures. To address ulnar impaction, both wafer procedures and ulnar shortening osteotomies can be performed with good results. Circle B, if the cartilage is badly damaged by chronic dysfunction or if the joint loss is mechanical properties, osteoarthritis may follow. And this can be addressed by a myriad of different procedures well known, including a resection uh, arthroplasty, direct resection, Boris emiresection interposition arthroplasty, Watson match ulna procedure, or Sauve Capongi uh, procedure, or a partial ME arthroplasty if the TFCC is intact or easily repairable, or even by your ME arthroplasty. Circle C, in this case, uh, the joint dysfunction results from an unrepairable ligament or TFCC rupture. Dorsal and permal distal radioulnar ligaments are injured, as Frederick show you, showed you, and um, ulnocarpal ligaments may be torn. You can use very easily and perfectly, the, with a good result, the Adam and Berger uh, ligamentoplasty, as you can see on this picture. Circle D, this is an um, instable a UCU case, uh, usually joint dysfunction are associated with a rupture or an insufficiency of the UCU sheath. UCU tends to get uh, recurrent dislocation medially and pulmonary because it is difficult for it to exert its role of a dynamic joint stabilizer. So tendon stabilization via reconstruction of the UCU tendon sheath may be necessary or using a ligamentoplasty. Most kinetic dysfunction of the joint have more than one associated pathologies, of course, each of which requires specific treatments. Those cases will be located in overlapping zones, which necessi necessitates a combination of treatments. For example, if one patient belongs to the intersection between A and D, that patient should be treated by the combination of a corrective osteotomy and a UCU tendon stabilization. If instead a patient be, be, belongs to a overlapping B, C, D, for example, the treatments need to address the cartilage, the ligament, and the UCU injuries. Treatments may include a partial lunar head arthroplasty plus a reconstruction of the radio lunar carpal ligaments and then a stabilization of the UCU tendon. In case of a single pathology, patient has an isolated cause of pathology, so treatment is dedicated to addressing that particular disorder. 
If the drug is instable because of a distal radial malunion, a corrective osteotomy should be performed first. And normally, the joint becomes fully stable once the malalignment has been addressed. Isolated cartilage defects of the ulnar head or sigmoid notch are not rare and can be treated with a myriad of procedures, including distal ulnar, distal ulnar excision, or Rath Watson, or uh, artery disease with distal ulnar osteotomy, that is the sobecapongi procedure, or even prosthetic arthroplasty. If the patient has an isolated symptomatic TFCC injury, this will need to be repaired or reconstructed. The classification proposed by Atsai and described by Didier and uh, Frederick is helpful in guiding treatment because it considers the reparative potential of the TFCC, the stage of the cartilage, the state of the cartilage, and the stability of the drug. If the patient present with symptomatic UCU subluxation, even dislocation, treatment uh, will be focused on the local capsuloplasty or retinolacular sling reconstruction by your ligamentoplasty. In case of dual pathology, when the patient um, has two, um, um, when two different circles of the vent dragon are affected, uh, the algorithm is based on the assumption that the treatment of uh, an associated pathology is the same. So if the drug instability occurs in the setting of a, a distal radio fracture, attention must be paid to anatomic fixation to the fracture, including the sigmoid notch. If a distal fracture of the radius has resulted in a, a joint instability with an irreparable TFCC, this can be addressed by combining a corrective osteotomy with a tendon reconstruction of the two radial nerve ligaments. If the distal radius is deformed and the joint has developed, has developed osteoarthritis, this can be addressed by combining a corrective osteotomy and a partial amyotroplasty of the joint. Finally, if a patient presents a symptomatic distal radius malunion with UCU subluxation, this can be addressed in a single operation with a distal radius correction, a corrective osteotomy, and a UCU sheath reconstruction. If you have three or four pathologies using the four-leaf uh, four, four clover algorithm, one identifies all the pathologies coexisting in the same wrist and tries to treat all of them as they were isolated injuries. But despite this, it's important to recognize that in trying to address all the pathologies, the surgeon must perform an operation that can rapidly address the patient's symptom with a definite procedure. So as such, in certain circumstances, we can perform with a one salvage procedure. So in conclusion, that algorithm is not a document forcing the surgeon to adopt one particular treatment, but all the different, the, that classical uh, treatment and well-known treatment can be um, uh, used. It proposes uh, to provide the treating physician with a checklist that helps to ensure that a, uh, one does not miss any of the different components that need to be addressed for a complete and um, perfect treatment. And it's a matter of addressing every component as it were an isolated injury with the aim to solve finally all the component. For conclusion, because of its, uh, its osseous geometry, um, the, the distal joint is an unstable joint. The soft tissues surrounding this joint must, contrib must contribute significantly to joint stability. So um, a proper understanding of uh, that complex anatomy and function of the distal radial nerve joint is essential for the treating clinician. Chronic instability of the joint continues to challenge orthopedic surgeons. And finally, the definitive surgical treatment of this instability or these instabilities remains controversial. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patrick, for your you know, excellent uh, brief uh, discussion about the very important and you know, less uh, known uh, about the DRUG and TFCC injury. Uh, so we can have questions uh, so that the panelists can start the questions and then they can mediate to the speakers. Yeah, uh, Terence. Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Terence, I, I have one question to all panelists. 
in chronic wrist uh, pain which is the choice of uh, investigation apart from x ray whether it is a mr is a ct arthrogram or is a mr arthrogram which uh, which is the preferable uh, mode of investigation individual preferred so maybe, maybe for acute uh, uh, for, for all for all individual uh, uh, i uh, are uh, answered on the on the chat i prefer ct arthrography because i think it's better the the, the slides are more thin and uh, i prefer uh, ct arthrography than uh, MR arthrography that is uh, very complicated uh, and uh, I think it's better that MR, MRI. Personally, I, I, I will ask for um, classic and standard X-rays, of course, uh, and, and CT arthro scanner too, yes, because uh, depending, of the, uh, depending on, the, on the quality, of course, of the uh, exam, but uh, uh, if you have a very uh, good uh, radiologist, you, you, you will perfectly see the, the lesion because uh, you know the different frames are um, each millimeters so the the, the, the precision is is um, uh, very uh, is very interesting for me the same thing first of all is a plain x-rays to assess the univariance as you have seen it's very important for the decision and secondary if you suspect any lesion of the TFC or to assess the cartilage, I do prefer arthro CT scan. I know it's not very popular in other countries rather than France, but uh, because there is, of course, an in irradiation with the consequence of the CT scan, but it gives for us very thin, uh, very thin exploration and very nice explorations. But MRI can be helpful too in the ULNAR Plus syndrome because we can, we can assess also the, all the ULNAR Plus lesions. Uh, with the different uh, variants in T2 sequences, and so it's very interesting too. But for us, arthro CT scan is probably the best exam. And for and for okay. me, too. Okay. We, we can see we can see the, the cartilage is uh, better than uh, with MRI. Yeah. Can you get can you get easily um, arthro CT scan in India? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do arthro CT scan only. That's why I asked the question. In India, I use arthro CT only. You prefer you prefer also arthro CT scan? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I do arthro CT scan. That's why yeah. I, call, I asked the question <laughs> because you told that it is not uh, popular in the uh, rest of the world. But uh, I in India, I do the CT arthrogram only. Hmm. Uh, we have if it is not, then I will go for MRI for soft tissue. But for uh, joint and uh, ligament injury, cartilage injury, I prefer uh, CT arthrogram. Okay. Well said, Vijay. Uh, Vijay is uh, motivating many of the young surgeons in uh, India to do uh, CT orthography, and I'm also started doing CT orthography for all these injuries, and it's really very helpful and useful. Uh, the other question is from to Dr. Fontes: um, What technique do you use with intact peripheral TFCC injury and pure foveal detachment? Uh, this is a question from Philip Matthew. I'll repeat the question: uh, What technique do you use? with intact peripheral TFCC and pure foveal detachment. In fact, if you have no peripheral lesions, the, the, the foveal detachment is the, the, convenient, the convenient of the, of the two on baller and dorsal ligaments. Also, if there is no tear of these ligaments, it's that the lesion is only on the central, central portion of the TFCC. So in these cases, it's only necessary to do a debridement if you do something. But if the lesion goes to the attachment of the ligaments, because the foveal attachment is the attachment of the ligaments, the polar and dorsal, and if there is a lesion at this, at this uh, area, so it should be necessary to retach it. Thank you. I hope you, understood, you, you answered the question. Uh, other question from uh, Augusto from Italy. Uh, he said, uh, uh, when I see a patient with suspicion of uh, TFCC lesion, is it better to request a normal MRI or an MRI with a contrast? The question from uh, Agostino from Italy to the panelist. Vote on micro, Fred. Dr. Frederick, unmute yourself. 
Yes, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, it's the same answer. Uh, I prefer CT arthrography or MRI, and um, I don't do a lot of arthro MRI. It's it's a long, it's long. We must do three injections, so I prefer do doing three injections with CT arthrography, uh, even for the attachment of uh, of the TFCC. Okay. I think it's better. We, we can see everything. Uh, the foveal insertion, the, the 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 styloid insertion, the cartilages. Uh, I prefer CT arthrography. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, Arjo, uh, please uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, I uh, I wanted to ask uh, Doctor DT uh, that uh, what is your take when uh, there is a TFCC injury associated with acetylopresty? Uh, interosseous membrane is, is uh, injured. So, is there any anything uh, you could throw light on? No, it's a very interesting question because, as you know, in SX lopresti lesion, you have a, generally a fracture of the proximal radial head and a lesion of the interosseous membrane and TFCC lesion, very frequent too. So, in my experience, when I have a mason one or two fracture of the radial head. I do arthroscopy reduction of the fracture with a little and I and synthesis with a little screw. So I do that with arthroscopy. And at the same time, if the patient experiences any pain on the wrist, and if you during the exam you will find some instability, I do also an assessment with an arthroscopy of the of the wrist. And sometimes I had these cases a few weeks ago. I had to reattach a TFC for a foveal lesion because it's more frequently. Uh, peripheral lesions rather than central lesions. And it's very interesting to, to assess systematically the wrist and specifically the TFCC when you have any fracture of the radial head. Very good question. Yeah, okay. very good. Uh, can I have the other question for, for, to the panelists? Uh, this question is from uh, Dr. Uma Shankar Raju. A very common questions from all orthopedic surgeons across the world. Uh, in a galaxy type of fractures, with the distal radial ulnar joint subluxed, uh, when we fix the distal radius, uh, if you find the DRUJ is still subluxating or not reduced, uh, we need to put a cushion wire. And how long we should put? How long we should immobilize? And in what position? Uh, this is a common question. Uh, probably all the panelists can go ahead with the opinion. That's right. Right. Well, personally, when I have to treat a galaxy fracture and if there is an instability of the uh, distal joint, uh, I use a K wire, of course, and I fix the, the, the joint in a supination. But supination is not always the, the, the good position. So if the resection is good and with no instability, it's a neutral position, I really do prefer to fix it in a neutral position. But normally, it's in supination, of course. And I for don't me, open the, the. Sorry. For me, my and because it... galliazzi fracture. If you have a DIUJ instability, it's because you have ligament lesion. So, as soon as you have reduced and fixed your uh, your radius, you, I, I do the assessment of the of the, the wrist with an arthroscopy too, and I reattach the TFC because generally it is a peripheral lesion of the TFC, and after the reattachment, the arthroscopic reattachment. The stability seems for me sufficient. I don't use any complementary KOR, but if it's, I think that the stability is not so, so satisfying, so I put the pinning too. But first, I treat the lesion as we treat the fracture associated. There's one point, uh, if I can make, sorry, I'm, I'm Vijay from UK. Um, Please. The, one of the downsides that you can have uh, after you put the KOR, if it is not in a in a perfectly central position with the with the ball in the socket of the DRUJ, you could be keeping the DRUJ in a slightly unstable subluxed position. But it is very difficult intraoperatively to be absolutely certain that it is in the center. The ball is in the center of that. So you could be keeping it unstable and preventing the natural healing. The other downside of putting a K wire, in my opinion, is that the forearm rotation is, is very, it's a very strong force. 
and that may easily o either overcome and break the K wire or bend it. And that may have a, that may have create more problems than the than the problem that you started with. So if you one of the point you can you can say is that if you do put a K wire, use a strong K wire and make sure it is in the the, the ulna head is in the center of the DREJ, and have the tip of the wire protruding on the radial side so that in case there is a breakage of the wire, it can be pulled out. I agree. Yeah. Uh, What's up, Patrick? I think uh, we have uh, come to the end of the session. Uh, probably this was a wonderful uh, session. Uh, the whole initiative was, uh, you know, taken from uh, uh, our uh, uh, Trichy Ortho Club Secretary, uh, Dr. Mukesh. Uh, he's supposed to be here, but uh, uh, because of his personal reason, he could not come. He was the one who initiated to have this topic, specific topic, because the orthopedic surgeons they have a lot of, uh, you know. Um, things which we need to be understand and with things which need to get clarified. Uh, with this uh, short uh, uh, conclusion, uh, we thank uh, Dr. Patrick, Dr. Didier, Dr. Frederick for the valuable time uh, spent with us, uh, especially on this day. Um, and uh, we are extremely grateful and thankful to you. Uh, before before uh, stopping this meeting, I would like to uh, 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 share a few uh, slides. Uh, these are the... Uh, Next program, which uh, our uh, uh, Journal of Hand and Microsurgery is planning. So this will be the uh, upcoming uh, journal uh, monthly meet, uh, which will focus on the congenital hand difference. Uh, please mark your dates, uh, 23rd January, uh, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. of Indian Center time. Uh, we'll be sending you the flyers and we'll be sending you all the details. Uh, so meanwhile, um, thank you all, one and all, the panelists, the speakers, uh, have a great day. Good night. We will see you in another platform with a different topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci à tous. Thank you. Au revoir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arju. Thank you, uh, Hashil. Thank you. Hashil. Sorry, I couldn't get you into the platform uh, on time. Sorry, we will have some other time. Don't worry. And Dr. Uh, Ashok, uh, thank you for joining us. We'll be uh, privileged to have you here. We'll be keep continuing working together for the subsequent uh, general meet in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Vijay, for organizing. Yeah. Vijay is the one who started the, uh, you know, uh, getting all the surgeons into us. So we should uh, thank a big thank you. <laughs> thank you, Vijay sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good night, safe. Uh, uh, thank you all. Good night. Bye bye. bye.